Did you know that there is nothing in the book of confessions of the Presbyterian church about the transfiguration? I looked it up. So what do Presbyterians believe about the transfiguration? Apparently the jury is still out. As the mountaintop is shrouded in, in a cloud, the meaning is shrouded in ministry. So with that in mind, let us begin. Right before this, Jesus predicts for the first time that he will suffer and die and rise again. Our passage begins now about eight days after these sayings. Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. Why eight? Why eight days in Mark? And we believe that both Luke and Matthew had Mark in front of them when they wrote their gospels. Mark has it as six days. Why did Luke feel the need to change it to eight days? I read about two different possibilities. It's on the eighth day that a child is circumcised as a sign of the covenant, a physical reminder of God's promise to Abraham in Genesis. You know, like, I, will be, I will be your God and the God of your offspring. So I claim you as my own, like baptism. And in our story, the spirit declares later, then from the cloud came a voice that said, this is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. So maybe that's it, a sign of covenant. The eighth day could also be a reference to the festival of booths or Sukkot from Leviticus. The festival of booths is a harvest festival, a joyous, sacred feast that remembers the Exodus, the salvation story. They stay in tents for seven days. And on the eighth day, reading from Leviticus chapter 23, on the eighth day, you shall observe a holy convocation and present the Lord's offerings by fire. It is a solemn assembly. You shall not work at your occupations. A burnt offering is a form of sacrifice, first described in the Hebrew scriptures. As a tribute to God, a burnt offering was entirely burnt on the altar. This is in contrast to other forms of sacrifice that were just partially burnt, and then the, what wasn't could be eaten as part of a communion or a sacrificial meal. So on the eighth day, in other words, the sacrifice that was made was giving the animal holy to God. And Jesus will give himself holy to God in his decision to come down off the mountain and journey to Jerusalem, knowing he will be arrested, suffer, and then be raised or die and then be raised. Oh, and did I also mention that this festival is also a pilgrimage to Jerusalem? The transfiguration acts as kind of a fulcrum in the gospels, you know, as they're going, they, you know, it's on a mountain, they go up the mountain to pray. So up until now, it's all up, up, up. Jesus is gaining in pop popularity. It's all good. And then when he comes down off the mountain, he's going down into Jerusalem and we Lent begins. The passion story begins. We go knowing that he is going to be arrested. He's going to suffer. He's going to die. So very often, all of the above is the right answer. Uh, and maybe we are, when we hear this, to think of circumcision and covenant and Sukkot, Exodus, salvation, and sacrifice. Our story continues. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure while he which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. There is much debate as to why Moses and Elijah were there. Moses had a similar experience that we read about in, of his face shining after speaking with God. But one scholar that I read said that's the only thing that they have in common in these stories, that their, face change, that their faces change. But here we have not only Jesus's face changing, but his clothes as well. And, you know, I have wondered whether it wasn't because he is divine. But then it doesn't say that Peter, James, and John's face is shown after seeing him. So I don't know. Elijah, like Jesus, ascends into heaven. They have that in common. It says they talk about his departure. Moses and Elijah both know what it's like to be pursued by secular authorities, 
right? So I can imagine them telling him, you're going to want to run because they both ran. But God will find you. Both Moses and Elijah had visions of God on a mountain. Both Moses and Elijah were expected to return before the final judgment. Did they... One theory is that they represented the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets disappear and were left with Jesus, which is more than enough. God with us. And again, maybe it's all of the above. The story continues. Now, Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep. But since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Some people believe that that... That is just added so we know that this happened at night, that they were sleepy. Others think it's an allusion to Gethsemane in in the future when they do fall asleep. Our story continues. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. Again, could be a reference to the Festival of Booths where we're meant to think of the Exodus because the, the, the fact that the Israelites slept in temporary, temporary dwellings, tents, when they were led out into the wilderness. But the author so, you know, basically gives us you know, uh, an out saying, it, you know, it's nonsensical what he says, so don't dwell on it. But while Peter was talking, while he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. A cloud often represents the presence of God in scripture. And then from the cloud came a voice that said, this is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone and they were silent or they kept silent. And in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. Again, lots of questions, not a lot of answers. This passage begins with Jesus going up the mountain to pray as if this incredible thing happened just, you know, out of the blue as a surprise. And that can happen. Elijah was hiding out in a cave and God showed up in the silence. For Moses, it was a burning bush, you know, off the path. I was listening to a podcast this week, an interview, a conversation between journalist David Brooks and historian Kate Bowler. Kate teaches at Duke Divinity School, and she's a historian, and she's also living with metastatic cancer. Um, she, there, there is no cure bar a, bar a miracle. Too much of her liver has been, um, is cancerous. And she is living with incredible grace and faith uh, and desperately wants to live, but is sharing this journey with us. And some of the blessings that I'm going to share during Lent are written from her pen. Uh, Her faith is real and raw and beautiful. David asked her in this interview, and when I see David, I always think King David. No, David Brooks asked Kate whether God comes and goes. For her. And I've never heard anybody ask that. And she said, yeah, I love honest Christians. It made me think of Aslan in the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the Chronicles of Narnia, when Lucy asked Mr. Tumnus, is Aslan going away? And Aslan is God. And Mr. Tumnus answers, oh, Aslan is not a tame lion. You can't control him. In faith, we believe that God is always with us, bidden or unbidden. But there are moments when we believe and there are moments when we know. Kate said that there are times when and she, she told this one story of she was about to go into a very scary surgery. And her pastor came and said a prayer with her and just a sense of peace and joy came over her that she's like, makes no sense. And surprises even her, but I had such a, she said, I had such a peace about me, which is nuts, but that's God, but not always. And that's real. Peter, James, and John have this incredible experience where they are awestruck, but they would have challenges down the road ahead of them in Jerusalem, at Gethsemane, at Golgotha, by the Sea of Galilee, into the future. What do they tell themselves when their eyes do not see and their ears do not perceive that God is and God is with them? 
wonder whether these words don't occur to them. This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. Jesus had just said to him, said to them, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and I'm going to be arrested and I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die and I will be raised. There will be suffering. There will be pain. There will be resurrection. This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. Whatever they faced in the days to come, they would have that memory to remind them of a greater reality than their present circumstances. Us too. Now I want to weave in our story with their story. Here we are, children of God, trying to stay positive and healthy, gearing ourselves up to rebuild, rethink, reimagine everything, you know, our relationships, our businesses, our ministry, our day-to-day, and another sock in the stomach that pushes out all the air in our lungs. Putin has led Russia into war with Ukraine, and we feel it around the world. Our hearts break for the senseless violence, and our lives will be affected. Now, you may be in a place mentally, emotionally, spiritually, you know, of peace, or you may be, find yourself in that pit called Sheol, where even on tippy toes, you are trying to look for God, but don't see. This is why we have this gift of memory, because we cannot always stay on the mountain. We have to go down into Jerusalem, into the pain and into the suffering. But may the words of God ring in your ears. This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. There is suffering. There is death. And there is resurrection. In our living and in our dying, we belong to God. My peace I give to you. My peace I give unto you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, nor let them be afraid. Be still. And know that I am God. And remember, I am with you always until the end of the age. We do not understand the transfiguration. Here's another theory. (laughs) So that maybe it's there so that Paul can't laud his Damascus experience over Peter. You know, read 1 Peter. It's like, like, hey, I had the transfiguration, buddy. There's a lot we don't understand. But we can know this. I pray that we might all know this. We worship the living God who is in our midst and is in our mess. God is seeking to bring wholeness and love and life and resurrection to the brokenness in our lives. Death does not have the last word. Sin does not have the last word. Love and grace have the last word. Resurrection will have the last word. We are living in troubled times. We have always been living in troubled times. Some of us have been privileged enough to know, or some of us have been privileged enough to not have to see it or experience it all the time, but the world has changed. And the world's pain lands at our doorstep daily if we're willing to look. We can engage. We are called to engage. We are called to respond with humility and kindness, seeking justice always. Remember that God always has the last word. And God is with you for the living of these days. Listen to Jesus, for he has the words of life. There will be pain. There will be suffering and there will be resurrection. In Jesus' name, amen.